Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. This is the three month vacation, and I'm Sean D'Souza. I'd been driving for about five years before I got to Auckland, New Zealand. When we moved here, however, my Indian driving license wasn't valid and I had to sit for both the written and the driving test. And I failed the first driving test within minutes. We barely got down the road and we were going down a slope when the assessor failed me. Ten minutes later, we were back where we started. As you'd expect, I was perplexed and I wanted to know what I'd done wrong. Now, he wouldn't tell me. I'm not supposed to tell you what you've done wrong, he said. You're supposed to drive correctly And when you make that error, I note that error, and I fail you. And you fail this test. This is how we often feel when clients won't give us feedback on our products, on our services, on our courses. But whose fault is it? Is it the client's fault or is it our fault? In most cases, we're at fault, and this is because of a primary reason. We fail to figure out the difference between testimonials and feedback. We use the word interchangeably. We call testimonials feedback and feedback testimonials. And it gives the client the feeling that they're supposed to praise you all the time. Now, praise is hard because you want to reserve it for special occasions And anyway, a constant stream of praise feels pretty worthless. So the first task is to separate the concept of testimonials from feedback. The client should know clearly and very clearly that they're not praising you but giving you feedback. Then they should know that you're going to do something with that feedback. So how do you get the feedback? And when do you get the feedback? That's exactly what we're going to cover in today's podcast. We're going to look at three things as always. And the three things that we're going to look at are, one, the safety issue and the reward issue. The second is the implementation issue. And the third is the specificity of your questions. Let's start off with the first one, which is the safety issue. There is a video online and it's called Austin's Butterfly and it shows a group of very young children appraising the work of one of their classmates. Austin, who's probably in the first grade, he's just drawn a butterfly. There is only one problem. The tiger swallowtail butterfly looks pretty bad. It looks terrible, in fact. It looks amateurish, and the kids know it. Even at that tender age, they're not about to let Austin get away with this bad rendition of a butterfly. Then something quite amazing happens. The teacher takes over and asks the kids to give their feedback. One by one, they pipe up with their critiques so Austin can take a crack at the second draft. They point out to the angles, the wings. They go on and on and on. And the illustration improves with every draft. Six drafts later, the butterfly looks like something you'd find in a science book. The finished butterfly is so stunning that anyone, you, me, anyone, we would be proud to call the illustration our own. And yet, this article isn't about whether we can draw butterflies or not. 
Instead, it's about safety. It's the reason why those kids walked Austin through every one of those five subsequent drafts. They felt safe. So what made them feel safe? And how do you get your clients to feel safe? Incredibly, that safety didn't start on the day of the Austin Butterfly demonstration. It started long before the teacher walked into the room. So safety, it needs to be created miles before you get to your destination. So what do we do on psychotactics.com? Notice the what bugs me on every page of the website. That bug, it's designed to create safety. Yet, you've seen organizations that ask for feedback before. Why does that bug bring in over 200 clients writing to us every single year? That's about 2,500 bugs since we started out Psychotactics. And the answer, it lies in a simple statement that accompanies the bug. And that statement says, we'll give a reward of $50 for the best bug of the month. But have we been diligent about this reward? I can't say that we've been super diligent in doling out the reward. We've missed it sometimes. But at a primary level, 99% of the clients aren't interested in the reward at all. They're just interested in fixing the problem. We have something similar in our membership site at 5000 BC. The moment you get into the cave, which is our forum on the membership site, you are faced with a question. And the question is, what makes you unsafe in 5000 BC? Now, even if you very casually look at that post, you will realize that members have asked questions. They've vented their feelings. And there's been an immediate response. But what is the result of that response? When people feel unsafe and they tell you why they feel unsafe and you fix that or you attend to that, now what you're doing is you're creating a factor of safety. And when you want feedback, you think, well, I'll just ask for feedback and I'll get feedback. And it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way at all. Even on our courses, we have an Ask Sean button. And... You can click on that and I get an email right away. I get a notification right away. And that way you are always feeling safe. So when you look at feedback and you say, well, no one is giving me any feedback. Well, you're not making it safe for them to give you that feedback. So when clients click on that link, whether it's the Ask Sean or the What Bugs Me or whatever, they're testing to see whether someone is responding. They're testing to see how they're responding. They're testing to see if they can trust the person on the other side. When I answer the question, I'm always aware that everyone is watching. That when you treat one person with respect, you treat the entire group with respect because they realize, well, this is what was asked, this was how it was handled. And correspondingly, if you treat one person with disdain, then you treat the entire group with disdain because now they know your system cannot be trusted, that they cannot give feedback because, hey, you will respond badly and so they will not give you feedback. So when you think of feedback and you think, well, I'll just ask for feedback, well, it's not going to work that way. Feedback is very clearly a safety issue. Without safety, you're not going to get feedback. Not the kind of feedback that you're looking for, at least. The clients aren't looking for rewards. Those kids in the classroom, they weren't getting any candy for their feedback. Their candy came in the form of change. Their opinions were valued. They were instantly rewarded with another draft and another draft and another draft. So when they made those suggestions, they wanted to be heard. They wanted to see change. And this is the main thing about feedback. When you struggle with feedback, it's because you haven't created an environment of safety. 
So that's the first thing that we've covered in today's episode. We've looked at the environment that creates safety so that clients can give you feedback. This takes us to our second part, which is the implementation. The article writing course has been held since the year 2006. And in the early years, we'd have three or four batches a year. We now have just one. This means that we've had several hundred clients on this immersion course and several hundred chunks of feedback. But why chunks? Because at the end of every course, we reserve an entire day as part of the assignment to get feedback. But why do clients give feedback? They do because of the first reason, which is safety. They also want to make the course better, just like the kids in the classroom. The reward is the ability to be part of change. It's been almost 10 years and we should have stopped getting feedback by now, don't you think? I mean, how much feedback can you get on a course? And yet, here is the highlight of last year's feedback. Now, I'm not going to read it to you, but you can read it in the transcript. And there are close to 20 points. What you'll notice is that there's a ton of feedback and every single feedback point has been marked with a concept of action. This is what I'm going to do. This is the feedback. This is what I'm going to do. This is the feedback. This is what I'm going to do. So all of those 20 points have been marked by feedback. You can read it in the transcript. But what we have there is an action list, and this is the most important of all. It's an action list based on a feedback list. So the clients come up with this immense list of things that need to be fixed, and they spell it out in a great amount of detail. We then compile that list. We put it in an action plan to fix the elements that need fixing. Almost as soon as the clients come up with the feedback, we demonstrated that we're not just going to ask for feedback, but we're going to take action. And that's what it is. It's an action list. What's going to be done? How is it going to be fixed? The same applies to any feedback that you get after what bugs me. Now, you've probably heard about Rosa, haven't you? If you didn't, here's the story. So Rosa, who's a client, goes and buys a product of our website called Dartboard Pricing. And it's about pricing, as you figured out, and she loves it, but she has something to say. And she says, I need to have these books in EPUB. And for us, this is a nightmare, a pretty big nightmare, because while it's relatively easy to transform books into EPUB, our books are filled with cartoons. We're filled with captions. And so these cartoons and captions, they need specific coding. And yes, the nightmare is slowly unfolding. It's slowly revealing itself. But we got in touch with Rosa and we said we'd work with the EPUB stuff. And then we posted Rosa's feedback in the podcast. And shortly after, another podcast listener said he'd do the job. I'll give you the link to the EPUB genius at the end of this piece. So anyway, this genius, Peter, he set about the task of fixing the books one by one. But first he worked on Rosa's request. This week I wrote to Rosa and I told her that we're not only going to send her the PDFs, but the EPUBs as well. And of course she was delighted. So the questions here are, do you think that Rosa feels safe? Do you think that she's bound to give feedback again? Do you think that she was rewarded both by the initial response and the implementation? The question does arise though, what if you can't implement something? Take for example the courses that we hold offline say the workshop we had in Amsterdam or Vancouver or Nashville. These workshops are designed not to give you information, but to give you skill. So clients come up with all sorts of feedback. 
even during the workshop. At the storytelling workshop in Amsterdam, Ellen, one of the participants, suggested a walking group. We walk in the Netherlands, she said. So now if you get to a workshop, you'll notice that you're not in the room a lot. That's because you don't learn a lot sitting down in the room for hours while someone goes blabbing on. So we get groups to leave the room, and we've done this since 2004, I think. We get them to leave the room, and we sit by the pool, sit by the stairs, sit in the lobby, sit anywhere that they wish to sit and discuss the assignment they've been given. And yet, here was Ellen talking about walking groups. So what did we do? We sent them for a walk. And amazingly, Half of them took the advice and they went for a walk. They went and did their assignment while taking a walk. They came back half an hour later, assignment was done. So half of them took the advice, half of them chose to sit instead. So the feedback went like clockwork, but it's not always so easy to get this implementation, is it? And when you can't change things, you head off objections at the past. Like, let's say for instance, you look at the feedback that we got in the last article writing course. And it said, Sean is handling too many projects at once. <laughs> That's like saying fire is hot or that gravity works. The reason why you're even reading this article or listening to this podcast is because I like to do it. I also like to paint. I like to cook. I like to take photos. I like to dance. I like to learn languages. I mentor my niece. And I also take a nap in the afternoon. That's a project too, you know. So... What would you do with such feedback, especially when you know that nothing is going to change? I mean, I handle the projects, but then I know what to keep and what to drop. Still, the perception may exist, and a client that's going through a rough patch might find me to be an easy target. Me, the guy with 10 million projects. That client may not have any idea that I'm not dancing right now, that I put my Japanese or photography on hold. So they're working off a supposition. They're working off their perception. And to make sure that this problem doesn't arise, we have to head it off at the pass. So I bring it up early in the course. I bring it up early in the book. I bring it up early in the workshop. It's on a slide. It's on an introductory page. It's somewhere where it cannot be missed. and. It needs to be repeated several times so that it sinks in. Because not everyone sees or understands everything the first time around. If you cannot or will not implement something and you have your reasons for it, well, you need to be very clear why you're avoiding that course of action. So Rosa's actions were doable and so we went ahead with the plan. But it's also quite a task to convert every book on the website to EPUB. If this were a case and we couldn't fix every PDF, we just have to work out something so that we could kind of manage the perception of the client in advance. Not everything can be fixed, not everything should be fixed, not everything needs to be fixed. Still, what we need to see is that the client is giving you feedback for a reason. The client is giving you feedback because they want to feel safer, but also because they have an idea which is far superior to what you're doing right now. And sometimes you can't do it, and that's fine. What you have to do is then manage that perception. But most of the times, what you have to do is take the feedback and see how you can work with it. And to get back on track, implementation is what matters. Implementation creates safety. Implementation, it tells your client that they matter, that their opinion is important. And if you can't fix it, at least put out an action plan so that they can see you're hard at work. Then cross out the elements as we're doing with this new article writing course. Will we be 100% successful? 
No, we won't, but we'll keep at things until they get fixed. And then we'll have another big list to go through. So in the first part, we looked at safety and we looked at reward, and that brought us to the end of the first part. And then we had a long dive into implementation, at least the need to communicate with the client, the importance of having an action plan. And this takes us to the third part, which is how to make your questions really specific. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. I know that part three is still waiting for you, but that would make the podcast too long. So let's split it up into two episodes. This is episode one and I'll release episode two as well. Now, if you haven't already started to implement all the stuff you've been listening to in this podcast, then it's a good time to join 5000 BC because at 5000 BC, it's not about more information. Information itself, we have information coming out of our ears and nose and everywhere else. What we want to do is implement things. And you will find that in 5000 BC, you are able to implement step by step. Why? Because the members are there. The rest of the members are there. They're not pitching. They're not selling. They're just there to help you. And I'm there 20 times a day. So 5000 BC is the first thing. The second thing is that we are going to have the workshop in New Zealand. And you might think, well, that's February of next year, but that's going to be sold a lot before February of next year, probably in the next month or so. So check out psychotactics.com slash X2017. And as I mentioned before, and I will mention on the next podcast, the EPUBs, they were created by authorsecret.com. That's A-U-T-H-O-R secret.com. You want to go there and Peter Barlow, he'll take care of you if you want to convert stuff to EPUB and do other stuff like that. So thanks to Peter and thanks to you guys for listening. You can always send me feedback at Sean D'Souza. That's on Twitter and Facebook and Sean at psychotactics.com. Bye for now.